there because we do we, we do appreciate everything that you do in supporting uh, CON. And uh, that is CRI. And uh, I'm not sure if you're online or not, but Ross, thanks for everything. Um, at the USA, Kennesaw State, uh, we've got Chapter 2 as a new sponsor, and that's Jim Dupree. Um, Texas, uh, Community Bank of Texas, and we've got our uh, Texas chapter part of us this morning, so that's great. Uh, Lee Davis, Law, and uh, we have a big thank you to Capital Grill, who has been a long time sponsor as well. So um, thank you to all of our sponsors. I hope you'll acknowledge it, and I hope you will actually check out your sponsors, see what they do, and see how we can support them and in, in their efforts. Um, Look, uh, just a, a fast recap. We've, we've kicked off the year in a fast way. Cordelia continues to do uh, phenomenal work as you all have met her now and probably getting to know her very well. She is our new executive director who uh, truly is connecting us. Uh, one of the things that I probably have learned more so uh, and uh, kind of refocused in on this year um, is what this organization uh, rounds it and really means between paying it forward, which has been a real big focus for us over this past year, but the importance of our net weaving, and that's connecting and helping each other before ourselves through our efforts of net weaving. And, and that's really what I would share with you all for um, a combination between paying it forward, which is a form of paying it forward, but is our ability of coming together and, and helping each other. And Cordelia has really uh, supported that and come up with some great programs and you can see the activity that's actually happened. We are seeing a lot of emails now on programs that we're doing and our get together. So um, that connecting point is a real important issue for us for, uh, for 2022. So uh, I, I encourage you all to keep an eye on your emails to stay connected with us, come out and visit us when we are face-to-face because -face, that is so important. Uh, we had our, our first, uh, uh, I guess, holiday get together uh, last month, and we had a nice turnout of over 20 people, and it was really refreshing. I mean, everybody had a great time. It was outdoors. We were able to social distance, but it was great to connect. Our mentees were out there, a few of them. Stan, appreciate you being out there. Uh, Arun was out there. And look, it's just it's just a perfect way for us to really connect when we're struggling so mightily uh, around this coronavirus. So um, let's stay connected, and let's keep moving things forward. Uh, we've also had just tremendous support um, with our programming this year uh, and I'm excited of all the things that, that Mike has put together, Mike Mike has put together. Uh, we've got a, a very active year, a very informative year, and I think very beneficial year planned ahead of us. And so for that, thanks, Mike. Um, and uh, I will at this point probably hand it over to Cordelia. There's a few other things that are going on. Just let a recap before we hand it over to Mike and Amanda. Uh, to talk about the program of some of the things coming up this month and, and uh, just so you're prepared and, and have an opportunity to um, uh, to plan this out. So, so Cordelia, if you don't mind sharing uh, the next few meetings in our book club, that'd be great. Good morning, everybody. Um, so one of the things that I've been trying to, to help everybody do, and I've heard from, I've been trying to talk to all the members and just find out what your experience is, what you like, what we can improve. And people definitely miss connecting. So we're trying to provide more opportunities for you to connect with each other online. Uh, so the, the speaker series is a great way to learn and connect a little bit. And then we also have some other programs which are just focused around connecting. Um, so we, ha we have something every week right now. Um, so the first week of the month, we had our first uh, CEO strategies meeting, which we may change the name of that to CEO chat. But basically that we pick a, an issue each month and you just come on the call and talk about your experience with that issue. So there's no speaker, it's not an educational program, it's a chance to talk to each other about the, the issues that you're dealing with or you, you've successfully handled. Our January meeting, our inaugural meeting had uh, about seven people and everybody talked about how they strategically plan for the year. Um, and so that was really interesting. And we're working on a topic for February. If there's something you're working on and you would like to hear the feedback of other CEOs, then let me know and we can make that be the topic. So that the first meeting is just, it's, it's talking to each other. Um, and then we have our speaker next month, uh, the second week of the month. 
and Mike will tell you more about that. The third week of the month, we have our happy hour, which will be at an outdoor venue and on a patio. Um, and you're certainly welcome to wear a mask, but we'd love for you to come out and, you know, to see everybody if that works for you. And then the fourth week of the month um, and the, the connecting events are at lunch. We have our book, our new book club. So uh, Mike will be hosting that. This month's book is called Pink Goldfish. It's a, a book about strategy and branding. So he's gonna talk a little bit about the book, but then it's also gonna be a conversation. So we do encourage you to read the book. So I've been trying to let everybody know the name of the book so you have all month to read it. <laughs> um, so we hope you guys will join in that conversation as well. Each month will be a different book, which is professional or business related that somebody in the group has really found a lot of value in. So um, Mike is coordinating that group right now. Um, but if any of you have a book that you would like to talk about, then just let us know and pick your month. So it's really open <clears throat> to any of the members who have something that they wanna share in terms of books. So that's what we've got going on right now. We're working on new programming, working on membership. And you know, I wanna hear from you. I've been sending out chat links so you can schedule time with me so I can just hear about your experience, hear what you like, what you don't like, how we can, how we can add more value. And uh, so please do that. And thank you guys all for being here so early. And um, thank you for welping, welcoming me. Thank you for welcoming Amanda. And with no further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Mike to introduce Amanda. And I'm also going to, I'm going to, as soon as I get off, I'm going to mute everybody. And then I'm going to unmute Mike, but that way, Everybody will be muted, and then you just have to unmute yourself if you want to talk. That way, we won't have background noise. Cordelia, before you uh, hand it to Mike, if you yeah. don't mind me interjecting a couple of things, I do want to I do want to share. It's kind of timely, but the the CEO strategies. Uh, fortunately, I, I I was part of that conversation, and you know this is what we're all about. But what came out of that was uh, some great conversations that each of us shared, but actually engaging. Um, I've had several members step back up and, and, and answer and help me on an issue that I'm having uh, regarding my board of directors. And it's that type of connection that's just absolutely invaluable and appreciated. Whether or not it goes somewhere or it doesn't, just the fact that we're engaging. And you know, my goal is to, is to really understand your businesses, your, your goals and objectives at where you're at in this point in time, because you know we do, we do meet, we do talk, but we really are trying to get a little bit more in depth so that we know how to help each other and, and how we can support each other. So that really is going to be a major focus. And that program was really rewarding. It also goes to the Troikas. Um, you know, we implemented the Troikas. It's, it really has been so well received. Hopefully you all are engaging and, and starting to meet and, and really get to know each other a, a little bit more than surface level these days through these programs that we're doing. And it really is one, a, a, a phenomenal way to, to get together. And ironically, I was um, happened to be at a, a, a invited to a meeting yesterday where there were um, business owners, all experienced entrepreneurs that have really been very successful. Uh, got a chance to share what we're doing at Sion a little bit, um, but you know it was amazing just to watch the communication going on around there, and, and it really did parallel what we do through CEO <clears throat> networks, um, but even at a more important level. So they're they're all getting educated on what we're doing. Hopefully we'll see a little, a little interaction of some of those members or some of those folks coming to be members uh, because we had a lot of help for them. There, there's a lot of programs we're doing that can help them. And one of the things that they were doing, and I'll just throw it out there. Well, first of all, the book that for the book club is on Audible. I do want to make mention of that. So if any of you have a, the means to download Audible, you can listen to the book. And then uh, that led me to also thinking about not only uh, recommendations of good books, which we're getting Bob Littrell has supported us with some of those books, but also interesting podcasts. And that's one of the things if you run across a good podcast, you think would be beneficial. Uh, it'd be great to share it out in, in our connections when we are together. So let me know because I'm anxious to find the best of the best in podcasting. So that'd be a good one. And Mike Blake does a great job. If you haven't heard his podcast, I, I would recommend it. And then lastly, Mark Bachman, thank you for introducing us to Amanda. And with that, I'm excited to hand it back over to Mike and uh, we'll let the Amanda take the stage. So thanks, Mike. All right. 
Is there any further ado? I think I've, I've Sorry, never, nobody ever says with further ado. They always say without <laughs> further ado. And I'm just kind of curious as to just one of those bizarrenesses of the English language that we never we never say that. But um, um, I am uh, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Amanda Satilli to to you as our speaker this month. Um, uh, Amanda has advised clients, including uh, some names you've probably heard of Cardinal Health, Coca-Cola. Delta Airlines, Home Depot, uh, the bank formerly known as Wachovia, UPS on, strate on matters of strategic agility, um, <clears throat> and you sort of you sort of get the point. She's pre she's president of a strategy consulting firm, her own firm, Satilian Associates, and uh, was referred to us by Mark Bachman. So, Mark, thank you for this. Um, and and her company provides experienced strategic um, and management consulting to Fortune 500 and emerging companies to generate profits, improve performance, and, and drive growth. She's also an author uh, of at least two books that I know of. One is called Fearless Growth, The New Rules to Stay Competitive, Foster Innovation, and Dominate Your Markets, and uh, The Agility Advantage, How to Identify and Act on Opportunities in a Fast-Changing World. Maybe those ought to go into our book club hopper, actually. And maybe we can entice the, the actual author to come back and run the book club thing. So Sounds fun. Always looking for ways to to shirk my obligations. So this is a, this is a great opportunity. Um, she earned her degree in chemical engineering from Vanderbilt and an MBA with distinction from the Harvard Business School. She is also past president and board chair of the Harvard Business School Club of Atlanta. And she was just telling me before she came on that the very, the highlight of her career was appearing on Decision Vision podcast episode one hundred twenty eight. <laughs> Should I take on more risk, which has now over 200,000 downloads? That last part is not a joke, so it's, it's gotten a lot of run. Amanda Satilli, thank you very much for, um, for, for educating us today, and the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Mike. Can you all hear me okay? <clears throat> Everybody hear me good? Well, well, Mike, thank you for having me on your podcast. It was a lot of fun, a great conversation, and um, the other episodes of your podcast are also fabulous. You inspired me with that to start my own podcast. So if any of y'all want to check out that podcast, it's at satilli.com slash podcast. Um, so, you know, yesterday I went to a talk by Professor Tom DeLong at HBS, and he had a really interesting point. He said that when he speaks, he asks folks to write down the initials of anyone in their career who they felt cared more about them than they cared about themselves. So I wanted to just pause for just a moment and let y'all think about that. Has there been anyone in your career that's cared more about you than you've cared about yourself? I'll give you 30 seconds to jot down a, a couple of initials if you have any. Cordelia, can you change it back to gallery view for just a minute? Uh, okay. I think that- You can I, change it on your own screen. Right, I got it. People got have it. to change it on their own, but it's got not it. moved from your spotlight. Good. Um, did anyone, did anyone, Think of anyone in their lives who they felt cared more about them than than they cared about themselves. A few of you. He said that people in their 60s often can think of three or four people if they're given enough time. And people in their 40s can sometimes think of one or two, but people in their 30s often have no one. And I think that this is a really interesting point because, I mean, you certainly, if you're a parent, you care more about your kids than they care about themselves often, right? So it can happen. Um, but he said that this is such an important aspect of people feeling connected to their work, connected to what they're doing and engaged. And when people are engaged, of course, their productivity 
and their agility and their creativity and everything skyrockets. So my books are really about strategy. They're about how companies who are very successful, but who are in the midst of tremendous market change can spot new opportunities and be able to act on those opportunities, be able to take action and capitalize on new things that are happening in the market. But what I've noticed is that there are some basic ingredients that are often missing. People aren't working well together. They don't know where they're really going together. They feel disempowered by the fact that, um, you know, they've been so successful in the past with the historic brand, with the historic way of doing things. The incentives kind of keep them boxed into doing what they've always done. And when it comes budget time, it's often just do what you did last year, but you know, sell 10% more for 5% less cost. And so we're all just kind of on this treadmill of doing what we've been doing when meanwhile, the world is changing very quickly around us. And so what I'm exploring now in my work is how we can kind of build the organization and the mindset at the ground level so that we can all be more capable of acting on opportunities. So I'm going to see if my Prezi video works here. Can y'all see that? Now I got to, can you see my slide? Yeah, it looks good. And, but is it mirrored? Is it? No, it's clear. It's in the right direction. Read it. Yeah. Okay. Good. Right. Yep. <laughs> good. Excellent. Good. So the concept of strategic agility is three parts. The first part is market agility, which is, do you know what's going on out there? And are you sensing and spotting new opportunities? So believe it or not, a lot of companies are not very good at this. They're very insular. They're not paying a lot of attention. They're not listening to their customers. And they are often not really accepting the fact that they have new competition that may be offering something very compelling to their customers. The second stage is decision agility, which is once you spot the opportunity, being able to make a fast and fact-based decision about what to do with it, how to act on it. What are you going to do with this? How are you going to be prepared to take action? And the third step is execution agility, which is if you've seen the opportunity, you've decided, you're moving on it, but being able to adapt as you go. So not just setting a direction and going there come hell or high water, but being able to continually adapt as things change. And what I've noticed is most companies, almost every company is good at one of these, and most companies are good at two of them, but there's very few companies that are good at all three. Either they are weak on the market agility, they're insular, they're not seeing what's going on or they're denying what's going on, or they're good at that, but they get stuck in the decision phase with analyzing things for too long or being too afraid of the uncertainty that's inherent in today's markets. Or they can do the first two well, but they execute in a way that's either too rigid or not clear with where everyone should be going together. And I wanted to point out that I'm happy to either take questions or just get comments all along here. We're not saving questions and comments till the end. So please jump in whenever you, whenever you have a comment on any of this stuff. If you can get good at this, if you can become agile, if all of your people are constantly thinking and are tuned into the marketplace of what's going on, you can actually develop a very important strategic advantage. And you can, if you were, what I notice is that companies are always in this horse race where it's neck and neck, you know, whatever you innovate, somebody else just copies you. And then you're back in the same boat. You're in the commodity game and you're competing on price. And then you figure out something new that you can do. You innovate that and then somebody copies you and you get in this race where you're just constantly um, competing on, on price and not really able to differentiate. But if you can get good at this strategic agility, if you can get good at spotting new opportunities and acting on them quickly and having your whole team really engaged in this, you can break out of the pack and it can create a sustainable competitive advantage where you can stay ahead for a long time. 
the problem, and this is something that I confronted when I first started writing the agility advantage, is that you still need those folks in your organization rowing consistently and efficiently in the same direction, because you probably do have a core business that is the cash cow. And you need to respond in an agile way, and you can't afford to upset the apple cart of those consistent day-to-day, -day, do the same thing type of things. And so um, there's this kind of stress between do we go straight and be efficient and you know teach people how to do things very consistently and drive out variability, or do we need to be experimental and testing things and getting out in the market? And this is something that, um, you know, is kind of a, an age old question of how do you maintain what you've been doing while doing something new. So I thought about this a lot and I came up with this framework. And again, this is, you can read this, right? Cause it looks backwards to me. Um, the, the framework is this on the Y axis is how much does this impact the customer's decision to buy? And on the x-axis is how fast is the market changing? So it's the speed and degree of change in the business environment. And if you can kind of think about the elements of your business, whether it's what your customer service is like, what your digital experience is like, um, the experience in the store, if you're a retailer, um, the um, onboarding process, the whatever it is, these elements of your business that you're considering changing, where do they map on this thing? How fast is the market changing? And how much does it really affect the customer's decision to buy? And when you find things that are in that top right box, where it makes a big difference and it's changing fast, that's where you really need to maximize agility. And in the other areas, maybe you can just keep doing what you're doing and be consistent. Um, so I'm thinking about a company that I worked with a lot a few years ago, and they had a new market opportunity that they were really excited about. And so they assigned it to several different people. Of course, everybody was very busy with their day jobs. So in each case, it was about a third of the person's job. And they said, go after this opportunity and here are your teammates. And they were really unable to move because they were still measuring these people on the traditional incentives, the traditional metrics that they had been measuring them on. And each person was doing two thirds of their time on their regular stuff and one third on this new opportunity. And it just moved nowhere for two years because everyone felt like they didn't want to jeopardize their main, um, you know, their main metrics. And they figured, well, I can sacrifice this and it, it'll be okay. Something's got to give. And after two years of missing the mark and seeing competition pulling ahead, they said, we've got to do something about this. And that's when I got involved. And we decided to create a fully dedicated team of folks that were 100% on this, not working on anything else. And we asked them, what do you need to be successful at this? Oopsie, did I just blank myself out? Hold on. Do you see me anymore? Oh, I see, there I am. Um, what do you need to be successful at this? And they said, well, you know, we've just got meetings all day long. I don't have time for this. And they said, we don't have any budget to go anywhere. And they said, and I'm not sure I can make these revenue numbers that you, you laid out for us last year. This just doesn't, I'm not sure I can get there. And so we decided, what would you need to be successful? And we said, dedicated team, make, protect them from all of those routine meetings and administrative things and kind of let them act as a startup, an internal startup. So they don't have to go to the um, staff meetings every week. They don't have to do this and that. And give them a travel budget to go see customers and see what's really going on. And finally, and most important, they were told, don't worry about revenue for now. What we need you to do is learn, go out there and learn. 
And don't go out there with a polish. Don't feel that you have to have a perfect pitch for the customer that you explain exactly what we're going to be offering because we don't know what it is. We've been trying to pitch this for two years and it hasn't worked. Go out and see what they really need. Go out there instead of with a perfect PowerPoint or a perfect demo, go out there with a whiteboard marker and just get in a room with them and sketch out what they think would be valuable. And by shifting the mindset to a learning mindset and by making this a really focused team, they found that there was much better collaboration among the team. They had a clear goal. They were very committed to each other. In a way, back to my first question, they cared more about the goal and each other than they did about their own selves. They were very committed to, to delivering for each other and the results were spectacular. So this is something that we really need to think about is how can we make more of our businesses like this, where people are really thinking, where they really have clear goals. And I always think back on um, when I worked in a manufacturing facility for Kimberly Clark, it was just such an incredibly fulfilling job because each of us had our role. We were, you know, functionally different. I was in process engineering. Other people were in maintenance or, or operations or planning or finance or marketing, but we all had the same goal of cranking out really great product every day and continuously improving on quality and costs. And it's really great when you're on a team like that where the goal is clear, where you know what each other can do, what each other can contribute, and you're operating in an area or a, an atmosphere of very high trust. Do we have any um, questions, comments at this point? Amanda, do you find that this parallels both big corporations as well as entrepreneurial companies? Well, I think it's much easier with entrepreneurial companies, but even with entrepreneurial companies, you can make the mistake of just doing what you've been doing and not realizing that the world is changing and not listening hard enough to what customers, how customers' needs are changing. But certainly the, the disease is worse in big companies. You know, Amanda, Ralph De La Vega talked about uh, when AT&T would go out and buy companies, entrepreneurial companies, they would tell them, look, you do your thing. We don't want you to become AT&T. We want you to go do your thing. And uh, that will work for us. It'll work for you, but it'll work for us because we're a big company and we could get caught up and wear you down real quick. That's so true. So many times, you know, I think around 80% of acquisitions don't really um, deliver any value to the company because you squash all the talent and drive that you buy. Um, you think you're buying something, but you kind of wring the value out of it by trying to make it too much like the mothership. And um, I think that if Ralph said that, that is very wise. I hope that that was really actually the case because I have a lot of difficulty with AT&T. <laughs> Well, I'd say that it's much easier to say than do, particularly as you get a couple of layers down below the CEO and people tend to still be protecting theirs or they say, yeah, but you right. know, that, that works except for when it comes to HR policies, we really need to have this. Or when it comes to financials, we really need to be able to roll up everything. So, you know, you, you have to comply. Otherwise, how can we consolidate and report to investors if we don't get the information you want? But, you right. know. Right. It's a tough one. Buying small companies, it's very easy to goof them up and very hard to, to really capitalize on the value effectively. Amanda, I think Ralph was saying that when he was still at Bell South. <laughs> no, it, became said, harder. it became a little harder, I think, when he got, uh, it was at and I think he was, yes, is Ross. I think he was a bit of a renegade and, uh, entrepreneurial guy, and he was commenting on the uh, mobility side versus the standard AT&T, which was becoming a dinosaur, right? As everybody gets rid of their phones. Right. Yeah. And uh, he was trying to allow, your points are very good, Amanda, on allowing a group of people to not get bogged into the bureaucracy and go out and listen and 
not feel constrained and and uh that, and you've seen some companies do that target a group of people that allow them to, to continue to operate right yeah it works really really well i could see that, that if uh, you can truly give them the freedom and truly make them a cohesive group with a clear goal where they're they're being honest with each other about what each person can contribute and they're um supporting each other and management is supporting them and this is your consulting role is you would help someone some large company do that yes to implement that okay i get it it's a very Thank typical you. case not every not all of my consulting projects are like that but it is a very typical case i normally get involved when um or a very common time for me to get involved is when companies have a goal and they just can't get on the same page of how to get there every function has a different point of view and they need someone to help them just get on the same page and decide what what to do what what do we need to change and how are we going to change it so let's see so so, Man so amanda can, yeah. can i ask you a question sure um so a company acquires a new company a larger company but acquires a new company and encourages that company to uh, remain um, um, quite consistent with its own mission, uh, or at least in, in to continue to provide value in that, in that sense. How about integrating that with the larger company in such, such a way that, that maintains the balance that you're talking about? That it's the second piece that hopefully you'll spend some more time addressing, because I, I, I find that quite interesting. It's, it's difficult to do effectively, but usually when you do buy a company, it's because there are real synergies with respect to sharing customers or melding the technologies or um, building on the brand that you bought. And so you have to do it very carefully and very thoughtfully in terms of what you're gonna allow to stay the same and what you're going to force to be integrated. So that's not a very thorough answer because it really depends on the situation, but I think it is one of the trickiest things in business is how to integrate effectively. Yeah, so when you put together Perfect. one, yeah. Just okay. perhaps at some point you can get into a specifics of an example of a company that really achieved that balance. That would be informative. I'm going to think about that in the back of my mind while I talk through a couple okay. more things and try to come up with a really good example. Um, so when you put together one of these teams, it's really helpful to have diversity of thought, not just uh, the conventional idea of a diversity, but creative people and analytical people and people who are good at building buy-in and people who really understand the nuts and bolts and even the skeptics. And um, I got involved in another situation recently where there was a company I was working with that was expanding rapidly and they were, they were buying other companies and attempting to integrate them. And they also had an internal startup and there was a lot of friction with the internal startup because um, the startup wanted to be set free. They wanted to be like, be able to act as if they were venture capital funded. And the mothership wanted to say, but well, what we created you because we wanted you to be able to make our core company better. We wanted you to be able to integrate all that technology. And we, we don't want you going off and selling to our customers without telling us what you're doing and giving us visibility into your contracts. We want you to be, um, you know, partners with us and working hand in hand with us all the time. And this was a great example of the stress that happens when you're attempting to do something new while still doing something old. Um, one of the things that they figured out was that because they were adding so much complexity and buying new companies, operating expenses were growing faster than revenue because you know, service was more complicated, onboarding was more complicated, um, sales was more complicated. The salespeople had to understand more things. And so a group of folks at this company decided to get together and see if they could fix this problem. And what was interesting about it was that it wasn't the executive team, but it was one layer down. So it was the vice presidents who reported to the executive team 
and they actually had never worked together closely before. They knew each other, but they had always been very siloed and kind of independently reported to their own um, E-team member, and they had not collaborated at all. And so for a, a couple of months, they attempted to get something going, and they weren't going anywhere, so they said, Amanda, come in and facilitate this, please. I was really hesitant to take the project on because I just thought they haven't made progress so far. I'm really worried. I can't, I can't fix this. Um, but I came in and we brainstormed what were all the opportunities that they saw. And we kind of saw them falling in four buckets. So we just defined these four buckets as being, you know, um, a revenue, a set of revenue opportunities, a set of service opportunities, a set of efficiency opportunities, and um, a set of opportunities related to how do we deal with small customers that are taking up inordinate time. And we put, we put together really diverse teams from all different functions to work on each of those things. And they found that they were seeing things that they couldn't see when they were in their silos. When you're working on revenue and you're just from the sales team, you can't see that, oh, we could offer a much lower cost product if we could just tell the service people that they can only, you know, that they, that they need to deal only online with this certain group of people who, who bought the lower price package is just an example. And so we actually, um, it was very interesting because once they were working on these four teams, it was a smaller group. They were cross-functional. They came up with new ideas and each week, we, the only time we could find to meet together was at five o'clock on Tuesdays because everybody was like fully booked the rest of every week. But five o'clock every Tuesday, we would meet for 18 weeks so far. And each week, one of these teams would present, here's what we're thinking. What do you all, what do you all think about this? We would get a cross-functional dialogue going of, oh yeah, that's really interesting what you all came up with. I think we could do it this way. And people were really, really committed to the overall goal. They knew that they had to straighten out this operating expense problem and and, or the gap between revenue and operating expense. And they were very committed to the goal and they were very excited to contribute and very honest with each other about what each of them could contribute. And so far they've got $17 million worth of opportunities already being initiated and um, underway. So this is the kind of thing that you can do even in a big company. Um, it wasn't an internal startup situation. It was just a problem that we needed to solve, but we were able to isolate the problem, define a clear goal, and put a diverse and um, cross-functional team on it um, to be very focused on solving a discrete part of the problem. So market agility. I don't know. Let's see. Yeah. So when you think about market agility, you're thinking about kind of concentric circles. What's changing inside our company, which could be different kinds of talent coming in. It could be um, new technology that we're implementing. It could be um, something systemic that's changing within the company. And then taking a step out, what's changing in our immediate market? So what's changing with our immediate customers, our immediate suppliers? And then the macro level of what's changing in the world in general that might impact us, which could be demographics or geopolitics or any kind of thing. And so when people put their mind to it, I think they're pretty good at analyzing market change. But I think the thing that they're fairly bad at is admitting what's changing. I think many companies are sort of in a sense of denial, like, I don't want that to be changing, so I'm going to ignore it. <laughs> or we don't want to be naysayers. We don't want to be negative. So no, we're not going to bring up the fact that something is changing that might be very threatening to us. I was working with a credit union who was noticing that their economics were really beginning to decline quite a bit. And nobody really wanted to talk about it because they kept hoping that they could turn the situation around. Everybody wants to be good at their job. Nobody wants to say, I'm not going to be able to do this next year because I'm in the middle of some very difficult things in the market. And the CEO finally said, we have to be honest here. We have to admit what's happening and we have to 
kind of suss out what's changing and what can we do about it. And so they got together and they began talking and they realized that there were some things that were changing in the market that they, they couldn't control. Overdraft fees in the market in general had declined to half of what they were. The spread on interest rates had you know, gotten to very, very small. So the traditional choice, sources of income had dried up. And they said, what do we do to fix this? Once they started thinking about it that way, and they all got on the same page of not being in denial, but saying this is a real problem, I think that the ideas started to bubble up. And when they did that, they realized that they could um, you know, really improve the digital experience for their customers. They could improve the rewards program on their cards, which was a big source of um, revenue, the card interchange. And they really started listening, watching the verbatims on the market research and saying, what are the customers really trying to tell us here? And once they did that, um, you know, they were really beginning to turn the situation around. But if they'd stayed in a state of denial, like some of their competitors did, I think they would have just had a gradual and slow decline. The other thing that they did very effectively was partner. So one of the things that I've noticed really good agile companies do is they do not keep this strict border around their company. They partner, borrow, and share. So if they have data, they figure out how they can combine it with other companies' data. Of course, paying attention to um, you know, privacy issues. They share their relationships with other companies. They share their assets. They might lend out their assets or rent out their assets or rent assets from other companies. They share their technology. They share their knowledge. And of course, you need to be careful about your intellectual property and careful with your data. But companies that are too insular and too much kind of circling the wagons and protecting miss out a lot on many opportunities for collaboration. And so what this credit union did was they said, the, the financial technology companies seem to be eating our lunch. There's companies like Chime who are out there saying no overdraft fees, join up. And they're the, one of the fastest growing um, fintechs that's grown to 25 billion in, in market cap. And they said, let's just partner with these companies. Let's set it up where our customers can enjoy what you know, the technology that the, that the fintechs are offering, but do it through us because we own the customer relationship and we have the branch. Um, so that's our advantage. We have something to bring to this party. So partnering, borrowing, sharing is really an essential aspect of business these days. I don't think you can, the days of being able to be a single company that can do everything is just over. And what I've noticed is that companies can just come out of nowhere. Like Instagram, when they were purchased by Facebook for 1 billion, this was years ago, they only had 13 employees. So you can just kind of piece together a company from components that you can get from elsewhere. So the, the, the thing about that is, is competition can come from nowhere really quickly, but also you can create something really quickly from nothing because you can piece it together from other things that are that are out there and available to you. When you do this, you really need to think like an explorer because you don't know where you're going and you don't know exactly what you're gonna need. And so you need to just incrementally keep testing, <clears throat> keep trying things and learning from your mistakes and learning from each of your experiences and being very deliberate about it. Um, I was working with a distributor who was doing quite well pre-pandemic. The pandemic hit and suddenly all the construction pro projects just stopped cold. <clears throat> and so their distribu distribution business was, you know, they were really worried. And they said to their salespeople who were really like pickup truck style salespeople driving around, um, you know, selling industrial and construction projects, process products. <clears throat> they said, you know, we've noticed that our competitor is laying people off. You've, you're, you're confined to the office now because it's a pandemic. So just call the customers of our competitors and just tell them it's not a hard sell. Just say, we're here if you need us. We've got inventory if you need us. Let us know if you need anything. 
And the salespeople really felt out of their element with this because they were used to driving around. They were used to the donut run and, and having strong relationships with a few customers. They were very uncomfortable with phones even. They were uncomfortable with cold calling. And it required a lot of support from management. So they had weekly meetings where they were very aware and, and careful to recognize tiny signs of progress. I think that's so important that you not set a big goal and only reward people when they get to you know, a, major, um, a major achievement, but just look for small things like, did you call anybody today? Well, what did they say? Did they share any information about with you about um, what they're going to be needing in the future? Did you build a relationship? Did you learn anything about them? And just rewarding the tiny signs of progress, even if it's not numerical pro progress, even if it doesn't hit the historical metrics. But by doing this, the management team was able to slowly build the confidence of the sales team to really operate in a different way. And they came out you know, by summertime, they were just gangbusters because they were there. The, the competition had pulled back and they had a 20% increase in sales the next year. So these things that you can do when things look bad is one important point, but the other is just be sure to recognize small signs of progress because you may not have big signs and learning requires watching the small signals, the really tiny signals. When you get in a learning loop, it really creates resilience and stability. So it's like riding a bike. Like if you can keep moving, you're going to keep moving. If you stop, you're going to fall over. Fast learning enables you to continuously learn and continuously adapt to the market. I'm thinking about a company that I worked with who was implementing a new artificial intelligence tool, and it was going to require a lot of change among their frontline workforce. It was a recruiting company, and these recruiters were used to operating in a certain way. They were used to looking through piles of resumes to find the best ones. They were used to making a lot of phone calls to find the best candidates, and this AI tool was going to serve up candidates that were well-matched to certain roles. It was going to require a lot of change. And we knew that there was going to be a downturn for a while in how much um, you know, commissions they were going to be able to make on their placements. So what we needed to do was totally shift the focus to how are we, you know, what do we need to learn this week and how are we going to learn it? So shifting that focus and putting the metrics really clearly in the learning camp rather than the um, kind of long-term uh, financial metrics camp enabled them to get through this hump and actually get the thing working much better than they would have if they hadn't put that clear focus on what do we need to learn this week? What did we learn last week? How are we going to implement our learnings from last week into what we do next week? So that continuous cycle is crucial. And even more important is goal clarity. Goal clarity can take you from the left side of the page where everybody's just moving different directions and trying as hard as they can, but all of those vectors add up to zero to having a common goal. And while everybody's not exactly on that goal because they're each in a different function, they're generally headed in the right direction and things can sync up where you develop the momentum to really move fast. Amanda, can I ask a question about goal setting? This is Cordelia. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things I've noticed very unscientifically is that the same goal needs to be spoken differently for different types of personalities. So somebody could say we have a revenue goal, somebody else could say we have a, a sales goal, and somebody else could say like, I need to feel good about connecting with customers. Those are all going to achieve the same result potentially, but they need to be like different kinds of people need different ways of being motivated. How do you integrate that into a large organization? 
the large organization is where where the difficulty happens because I do think it's extremely important to have people well matched to their roles where they really feel like they're in a state of flow a lot of the day. And there's some interesting research by um, Teresa Amabile at HBS. And she um, had a thousand people journal every day about what, what they were doing, what they accomplished and how they felt that day. And what she noticed was that the, the key determinant of engagement, happiness and productivity in a role is that you could see some progress every day. And that the progress wasn't reported to you by your boss, but it was just something that happened as a result of the job. So it might be if you were in customer service, it might be a customer saying, oh, thanks so much. I'm, I, you fixed my problem. Thank you. Or if you're a developer, it might be that you fixed a bug in the program. If you can build the jobs such that the job you know, gives people feedback every day, that's the ideal state. And you asked about how to express the goal in different terms. I think that matching people effectively to roles so that they're really in a state of flow and they're really doing something they feel competent at, but they're also learning fast is critical. And you need to partner with them to say, what, what turns you on? Like, how do you think about it? How, if I say we need to grow revenue, how do you think about that? And kind of give them some choices, just as you just explained, Cordelia, um, you know, to get their minds working about how do I want to contribute here? What's my contribution? And have them talk about that with each other. I, I learned a lot. You know, sometimes you learn stuff in the most silly little ways. But I remember when I was like volunteering for something at my kids' elementary school years ago, and everybody was going around the room saying what they could contribute to this project we were working on. And people were saying things like, I'm great at initiating and starting things, but I'm terrible at finishing things. <laughs> or another person would say, um, I'm a doer. You know, I, I'm not typically the one to come up with the ideas, but if you tell me what to do, I can really get it done. And each person was very honest about here's my strengths, here's my weaknesses, laying it on the table because there was, you know, it was no risk. It was just a volunteer thing. And I just found it so helpful. Like now I know who to go to, to get certain things done. And I think that that process of goal setting um, in people's own terms, what they think is really exciting about the goal for them, for their role is very important. So thank you for pointing that out. Other thoughts? I, I have a question that goes back to kind of midway through the presentation, but I, I didn't want to interrupt at the time. But you, you talked about, about building teams around people with multiple approaches to problem solving, um, multiple approaches to creativity. And, uh, you know, I, I, I like that. Um, but at the same token, to me, it, it sort of rubs up against or creates fi friction with the concept of fit when hiring, right? When we, when we talk about cultural fit, I think most of us talk about, well, we're trying, we're trying to hire somebody that already fits into what the status quo, which implies that you're going to be hiring people that are, are fairly similar to the people that you already hire on your team, right? Which, which creates a trade-off of basically harmony versus diversity, right? Mm -hmm. I think you could sort of create that two by two matrix there. And I'm curious, first of all, am I thinking about that the right way? Am I getting something wrong? And if, but if I'm not getting something wrong about that, what are best practices to, to reconcile what I think is, is an inherent conflict between those two, those two hiring paradigms? Yeah, I think you've you've pinpointed something that's true is that if you keep hiring people that are copies of who you already have because who you already have have been successful, you're going to get in a rut and you're probably going to miss something that's happening out there in the market. So of course you need to have people on your staff that are sort of similar to your customers, right? Mm -hmm. Um 
And I think you also need to th be thoughtful about the different kinds of mindsets that you need on your team. And it forces you to get out of the kind of get out of the routine of hiring people who look like who you already have. And it, there can be some growing pains for sure, because you bring people in who don't seem to fit at first. And if they're the only one like that, they really don't fit. And then they're likely to quit because they're just thinking these people are weird. I can't even, they don't understand me. I don't understand them. I'm the only one like me. Um, so you need to be very thoughtful about how you expand into adding different types of folks. But when I put that slide up about the diversity, I was partly thinking about when you're already in an organization, there is a lot of diversity there that just is, is already there. And so when you put a team together, you can be thoughtful about having the creative folks, the analytical folks, the skeptics, the optimists, the um, nuts and bolts folks, the relationship people, and making sure that you have a good mix just taken from the folks that you that are already there. Are you muted, Mike? Some people have said that's how I sound best. Um, <laughs> so, um, so what I what I what I take from that is is perhaps a way to a way to address what you're just that that I'm going to call it a paradox because I think it is a little bit of a paradox. One, I infer from what you said, if you have to, if it's a choice between fit and breaking fit, you'd be inclined to encourage somebody to sort of break that that quote unquote fit model or redefine it. And, and I think I agree with that. I think my answer to that might be, and again, please tell me if I'm wrong, but I think the, I think the answer is you need to change your culture and how fit is defined, right? And, you know, and, and in the way that I think about it, my very simple-minded way of thinking about it, the culture may be we hire anarchists, right? Mm -hmm. The fit is that people don't fit, mm -hmm. right? The fit is that people like to throw bricks at the status quo and that people question everything they may question things from a different perspective because that's the language they speak walking in. Mm -hmm. um, but but the, the common thread of the culture is to question everything, for example. Well, somebody put in the chat, I'm not watching the chat very carefully, but they said fit for values and ethics. And I think that makes a lot of sense is mm -hmm. there's certain non-negotiables that that you need to have in the people that you bring in, whatever those non-negotiables are, um, you need to be clear about that and and know how to hire for it. And I, I would share this, um, you know, we're a company that has been innovating since day one as a startup little company in 1983 to where we're at today. Uh, we have survived on being innovative, um, but, it's interesting in all my experience that I have from uh, an entrepreneurial perspective is that it all starts with mindset and starts with leadership that's willing and able to support that innovation at every level. It isn't just product innovation, but it's improving your areas through innovation. And if you don't have that mindset, it will never fit into it. It won't build that culture that Mike just talked about. They will, they will then bring down that culture if they're not willing to to innovate or accept innovation. And um, it's, it's something that is very, very difficult and requires people to accept change and failure very quickly because a lot of the innovations don't succeed and they feel it's a waste of time. Right. So until you actually have a successful innovation and you prove that to them, then they realize the value of it and they start opening their mind to, hey, I could, I could throw something out there and see what happens. Right. I think come, the bosses ask for innovation, but then they don't support, they don't provide the folks with what they need to be able to, the, the space and time and money and resources to be able to succeed. That even goes for, uh, for us as uh, CEOs of these companies. Um, you know, I'm the one that uh, chases the shiny red thing, as my team likes to say. Uh, <laughs> but that's, you know, that's what I'm good at is, is finding the next possibility right the next opportunity mm -hmm. um, and so they've had to learn the successes and the failures of that along with me and I've challenged them because I got to keep up in the early days um, and then we had a lot of lessons learned along the way that you know 
bringing products to market before they were truly ready because we had innovated it and we brought it to market and then we got some process failures to support it. It challenged them to continue to think and improve and get better at every step instead of giving up. And, you know, some did, some wouldn't support it and, and became barriers, but most of the people, by the time we were done, um, were very open-minded to change and very open-minded innovation. And it's, and it really does lead to a culture of innovation, which um, is so important today. And and I meet with big companies. I met with, um, many of you know, Alba that was here at UPS. And we actually sat down a couple of years ago and we're talking about, uh, she's kind of running innovation through uh, UPS and and hitting roadblocks at every step. And she's like, I don't know how you do it. You're, you're always finding new things and figuring out ways to do it. She goes, I, I, I just get bogged down. Well, she actually, I've been watching her for the past few years now, the things she's doing, and she is definitely changing uh, the innovation over at UPS. You could do it in a big company or small. UPS is a perfect example because, you know, for years they've hired industrial engineers who've just like cranked the efficiency into everything. And if you, they hire so many new people every year and they bring them into this process that just works like clockwork, you know here's what you wear, here's what you, how you walk, here's how you ring the doorbell or whatever. Everything is just perfectly timed and perfectly efficient. And now they need to do something new. Oh my gosh, but we got to deliver millions of packages today. How do we do both? And so in my experience working with them, that is a big struggle. You know, they're like, do we change the culture? Because the culture really mostly needs to stay the same. We mostly need all that consistency and efficiency that we've always needed. We just need innovation in some areas. So how do we do that? How do we balance those things and, and make them both happen? Amanda, um, I, I've, I'm just wondering if the following is, is something that would be fruitful to, to think about for a minute. Perhaps you've spot, thought about it a lot, I would imagine mm -hmm. you have. How, if you're the acquiring organization, if you're the organization that's going out and bringing all these new entities in, is there a systematic approach or is there a way of generalizing across um, individual situations about how that parent organization knows that the process is working, knows that, that it, it, in fact, it's achieving something, it, I mean, is there a way of generalizing across companies or is it really a situation where it's kind of one off, meaning each company only is got to figure out on its own using its own metrics, whether or not it's succeeding with doing the engaging in the process that the processes that you're now talking about are really yielding benefit. I'm just are wondering you talking about that. specifically about acquiring and integrating. Are you talking about everything? Everything. I'm sorry to everything. interrupt. Okay. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that we're past the nine o'clock mark. So um, I love the conversation. I love the Q&A, um, but I also want to formally close out the program for people who need to move on. And, you know, as long as Amanda is willing to stay and people have questions, we can be here. But um, I didn't know how you if you want to wrap up or and then do questions or if we should just keep going. But I do want to acknowledge that we're at the hour point. So um, two things I wanted to say before folks leave, um, come to my website, satili.com, and you'll find interesting things there, um, videos and, and blog, and also my podcast is there, but also connect with me on LinkedIn. And if you would like a copy of either of my books, send me an email at first initial last name, A-S-E-T-I-L-I at gmail.com, and I will get you get a copy to you. Thank you. And I will also send that out to everybody as well. Okay. Good. Uh, Thank you. So um, I will uh, let you guys continue your, your conversation. And if you guys need to move on with your day, thank you so much for coming. I will be sending out a survey because I really want to hear your thoughts about how the, the event went, how we can improve it, um, or what was awesome. Um, and thank you so much, Amanda, for coming. It was really interesting. We really appreciate your time and energy today. Thank you so much. Fun. It's fun. All right, I'm gonna hop off here and let you guys continue your okay. chat. Okay.
man, I think <clears throat> it was asked about uh, a company that has actually innovated that you've experienced. Um, I would love to have that answer too. It's it's sometimes difficult to find that and to, and to mirror it and see what they're doing. So uh, that would be a, an interesting answer, even if it's down the road, if it, I'll email you and if, even if you could share the email it would be great. Yeah, I think that, um, I think there are pockets of great innovation in many companies. Um, if you look at even UPS, some of the things that they're starting to do with their mobile app, Delta's mobile app has been fantastic. And look how fast they've innovated through the pandemic. So many, so many changes that have been fabulous. And they, you know, they've got the big engine that needs to keep running too, of keeping flights safe and in the air and, and all of that stuff. Yeah, I see Delta, I, I follow them closely. They are um, inspiring to say the least because they're always innovating. And they they're are. one of the leaders that I see uh, in innovation at every level, right? How they clean planes, how they communicate, you know, their technology, all of it is unbelievable. And if you, if you, you know, observe that, there's some, I would love to hear how they get to those points and what do these companies do, you know, to really plan this out, you know, my innovation, in my experience, is, it comes from, you know, people that bring ideas to the table, but we're looking out, you know, a year or two, they're, they're innovating on the fly, especially during the pandemic. Right. I think that two things that they have that are really special is, though they hire a very diverse workforce and they have to hire thousands of people every quarter, I'm sure, um, they hire for kind of a heart of service. People at Delta are very committed to service and to the customer. And I think that's kind of a common bond that enables them to figure stuff out quickly because they feel that it's really important for the customer. That's what I've noticed about them. Amanda, one of, you know, as we were talking about innovation and, and, and uh, moving the organization forward, um, isn't there a certain element that I don't think um, was discussed is about the appetite for risk? <laughs> both for the organization as an enterprise and for the individual as a career you know yeah. what if you know i go out on a limb do i have that support or is there a you know thousand foot drop that you know is going to land me someplace else um either with investors or with my career or whatever you speak to sort of how to instill um a risk appetite that is appropriately um, bounded? Yeah, so I think that the ability to act quickly amid uncertainty and the ability to know how to manage risk is one of the key differentiators between companies that succeed and those that fail. And I think that that personal fear of getting fired or having an up, a misstep or just having a really difficult year with too much work is what keeps individuals from contributing all that they can. And so I think that the key with managing that effectively is to make it much more explicit. So when you have risks lurking in the background and nobody's talking about them, that's when they slow you down. But when you name them and clarify them and size them and then assign them to somebody or assign them to a team to manage and be very explicit about it, that's when I think that you can move pretty effectively. And of course, um, you need to protect folks, you need to protect people's careers and say, if this doesn't succeed, you will still be here. You'll still succeed. We need you. We like, we like what you can contribute here. We're asking you to take this risk on. It may not, it may not succeed. We want you to bust your tail trying to make it succeed, but it may not, and you've still got a home here no matter what. But I think that you know, just being explicit about the risk and assigning the risk to folks to manage and figuring out how you can, how you, you know, the explicit steps you can take to mitigate the risk is everything. It seems like a, a really fine example of a principle of the kind of thing I was asking about, a principle that um, to, it, that defines organizations that are succeeding in this environment. Right. And, and they know 
they know that they're they're succeeding. That that principle, working with that principle and measuring it, right, and, and talking about it and addressing it, that's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah, Harris, you were asking about general principles or processes that you could use that work in every company. I tried to distill that in my second book, Fearless Growth, especially because when I wrote The Agility Advantage, people started coming to me saying, help us be agile. And there was like so many reasons why they couldn't. You know, it was just like they were paralyzed by so many aspects of what they were doing. And so Fearless Growth kind of goes into how do you get over the fear and the risk by giving up control to gain control? So giving up control to your employees, empowering them, giving up control to your customers by getting them involved in the process, um, giving up control to part business partners by forming partnerships with companies that can help you move faster, um, giving up control in terms of being willing to kind of take on learning as opposed to strict financial metrics. And um, I think that those general principles apply everywhere, but the way that you apply them is very different from company to company. And that's what keeps me in business. (laughs) That always has to be tailored. Quite cool. Yeah, it was really good to meet all of you all guys that I didn't already know. And um, please at least connect with me on LinkedIn so that we can stay in touch. And uh, let me know if you'd like a copy of the book or, or check out the podcast. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, I think if we have any more questions at this point, you should definitely shoot Amanda an email. It's in the chat. I'll send it out or connect with her on LinkedIn. And thank you guys, everybody, for coming. And uh, I hope you all have a just a wonderful day. All right. Thank you so much. It's been fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Amanda.